Hi everybody, welcome to South of Live. Um, seems like we have a few new people uh, here and some of you have been waiting for a while. So I would love for, I would love to know where you're from and where you're joining us from. So please introduce yourself um, in the comments. Meanwhile, I will get started with our trivia question. March 5 was National Poutine Day. What are the three key ingredients of poutine? Now, this is like if you're if you've been in Canada for a while or if you're just interested um, in Canadian culture, this should be an easy uh, trivia questions to, question to answer. So feel free to drop your uh, your responses in the comments and uh, we'll share it towards the end of our segment. Um, for now, let's start the show. Live is an interactive YouTube series made to help self of test takers understand a little bit more about the self of test. So if you're about to write a test or you're thinking of considering self of test, I would recommend that you subscribe to the channel and click on the bell icon to be notified as soon as we have one of these live episodes. In today's episode, uh, we're exploring strategies that can help you improve your writing skills. Uh, Randy will be going through six crucial steps that uh, can help you get the scores that you need. So without further ado, let's welcome our favorite instructor. Hello, hello, welcome. How are you doing, Brandy? I'm very well, thank you. I was just checking out our, our guesses here in the chat box about Putin, and now I'm starving. So I'll have to put the thoughts of delicious food aside and, uh, and get through our writing tips. But keep your guesses coming in. If you don't know what Putin is now, wait till we tell you what it is at the end of the, the episode, and you'll have to go out and try it. Yum. Yeah, yeah it's delicious. Um, okay, I'm going to let you get started. Uh, Randy, we have, like, some people have been, like, waiting since, like, six 30 a.m. Wow. Talk. Okay. So these are beavers. All right. Yeah. Well, great. Let's get right to it then. Without further ado. So I'm just going to pull up my slide presentation. So yeah, we're going to focus on some writing skills today. And what I'd like to do is present, we'll call it a step-by-step -step guide. And I, I'd like to start off with talking about the foundational skills that everybody must learn when they're learning the English language in order to begin the journey of communicating clearly. So we'll talk about those beginner level of skills, and then we're just going to add to them bit by bit, step by step. We'll talk about six different skills that are important for your writing. And we're really looking at, from a self-hip perspective, at the entry level, we'll call that self-hip level two or so. So again, beginner level. And we're going to work our way through the intermediate level writing up to the advanced level writing. So I'm showing you um, a self-hip scoring chart right now. So if you're new to the test, self-hip writing and all parts of self-hip, are scored out of 12 different levels. So if you do achieve a level 12 in your writing, it means that you're already a very advanced communicator with your English language proficiency. Not all of us here today are probably working at the advanced level, however. So the, the focus of today's episode is to present skills that we can adjust and, and refine, and again, learn the higher level skills when we're ready to do so. So to accomplish this goal, I'd like to share with us all um, a real cell pit test question from a past cell pit test. So you'll never see this question again in the future, but we'll talk about, we'll read through that question first as a group. And then I'd like to present small excerpts. An excerpt is just a very small section of different test takers' answers to this same test question when they took their cell pit test from the past. So again, we're going to start about a level two and then we'll see how the skills we're discussing for writing are, are evident in the different test takers' answers as we climb the score chart, so to speak. So we're going to end today at a level 12, which is advanced. So before we can get to the skills, I'd better share with you the test question. So again, if you're new to CellPIP, you will be taking this test in a, in a testing center. So the whole test is done on the computer. So you're looking right now at what your computer screen would look like for the writing test itself. So this is a, a practice question from task one, which asks you to write an email. So I'll read out loud the left-hand side here first, because you would need to understand the background before you could start thinking of details to answer this question on your test. So it says here, you just came home from the grocery store and realized you were overcharged for several items that were supposed to be cheaper. You called the store and were told that you had to come back in today to fix it. 
The store is an hour drive away. Now, looking at the right-hand side, you'll notice in blue at the top, it tells you who you're supposed to email. It says to write an email to the store manager in 150 to 200 words. Your email should do the following things. So first, explain the problems with the items you purchased. Second, explain why you cannot return to the store today. And third of all, describe how you would like the manager to resolve the problem. So on your actual test, if this was your real question, you would have 27 minutes to complete the entire email. And you would be typing your answer right into the same computer screen. There would be a little writing space below where this question is displayed. Now, I'm not going to show you the, the entire answer from every single test taker. Otherwise, we'd probably be here far too long <laughs> this morning. But what I would like to do is, is introduce to you how your writing samples are scored, first of all. And then we'll get into the particular writing skills that are going to help you maximize your score. So the writing test right now for CELPIT is assessed by human raters. Raters are the people that are giving you the score for your writing test. There are at least four different uh, raters for the writing test itself. And they're reading through the submissions you make in order to look for as many strengths as they can in these four dimensions that you see listed on the left. So dimensions are basically like skills categories, if you want to think of it that way. So the first thing the raters look for is your content details. So the more specific and interesting, the better the score there. The vocabulary will be assessed. So hopefully your words make sense and are very focused and precise as well. Readability is that area that en encompasses your grammar, your paragraph skills, your sentence structures, and so on. And then task fulfillment would be about answering the question completely, making sure all of the details are on topic and make sense. So even though all four of these categories are very important, they're going to work together as a group to give you your overall score. For today's episode for the writing skills, we're only going to look at the readability section. So all of those little examples of the writing that we're going to examine today, we're only going to focus on things like their sentence structure, their ability to connect ideas together with the right linking words. We'll look at paragraph skills, spelling and punctuation and so on. All right, so we're not going to talk today about the content details or the vocab or any of those other important skills. We'll save those for another episode, but for today, it's just about the writing skills. That will be the main focus. So the very first skill that I'll present to you, and this is beginner level, it's crucial for any language to understand how the words are going to be formed and in what order. So your syntax is literally choosing the, the right words and ordering them in a way that conveys a very clear meaning. It's creating the, the foundation of a well-formed sentence. All right, so I'm gonna show you again, very basic or simple syntax that we would have to learn first, specifically for the English language, because syntax varies depending on what language you're going to be examining. So up top on the screen, I've just got a little summary of uh, the test question just to keep us focused. So remember, all of the examples I'll share with you today, we're dealing with uh, understanding that the person had been overcharged for groceries and they had to email the store manager to fix it. So syntax step number one, every single sentence in the English language absolutely must have a subject and a verb. This is, there are no exceptions to this rule. This is 100% of the time. So it's a really good rule to understand and memorize. Your subject is the person or the thing that is doing the action. The verb is the action itself. So I've got very simple examples, three of them, as you can see on screen, to show you how the subject and the verb work. And for English, it has to be this order. You can't mix them up or you start to confuse the reader. So I would be the person and the, the action that I am doing would be to eat. So I eat, subject verb, you read. She cooks, always, subject verb. So again, that's step number one. We have to have that first before we can add on more complex steps. So I'd like to share with you um, a little section from somebody who wrote in on their self-web test and they happened to earn about a level two. So this is beginner level, this is entry level. Can you please read through this part of the response and start trying to make sense of it all? Okay, so it's beginner level. So there are quite a few little grammar and writing mistakes there that we notice. So it's a little bit challenging to grasp the entire idea because of the errors, but 
what this person has demonstrated correctly in a lot of cases is that simple syntax. We do have a subject and a verb in many cases here. So when they say you overcharged, you would be, I guess, the, the grocery store or the store manager. And then you return. I living is not the correct verb uh, tense. We understand that, but they mean I live, right? We can grasp that or make sense of that on our own. And then I come. So again, with all the other writing errors around this, the fact that at least we've got that simple syntax started, we're starting to convey meaning. And that's crucial in order to add on, which we're going to do right now. So once you've got the subject verb order, we're going to add in the object of the verb. So you can see the same three example sentences that I just shared with you earlier, but I bolded or darkened the object of the verb. The object is what the verb is doing. So for I eat, I say, well, what am I eating? Well, I eat apples. You read, what do you read? You read books. She cooks, what does she cook? She cooks dinner. So adding in the object is giving more information, which of course makes it a lot easier for the reader to again, begin to make sense of writing, particularly at the beginner level. So we've moved up one step, we're at about a level three. So this is still beginner level, but just read the sentence here to yourself. And again, try to make sense of the main ideas if you can. Okay, so again, quite a few little grammar and writing errors here still, which is common when we're beginning to learn any language rather. But because we've got this syntax, we've got this subject verb object emerging, we can at least start to make sense of the basic ideas, which is, is key when we're beginning our studies. So I made this email. That's your subject verb object. We bought milk. I saw the price. I believe that's a word choice error, but I, I would understand because of the topic that it's probably the price that he saw. So we're getting there bit by bit. So once you've got this basic or this simple syntax, and again, syntax is the order of these foundational parts of the sentence, you're now ready to start adding in your capital letters. So every single sentence has to begin with a capital letter, and then you'll end it with an end punctuation mark. So this is what it would look like. We'll take those exact same three sentences we saw earlier. So this was the subject verb object. And all I've done is I bolded or highlighted, I guess, in yellow. You'll notice that the first letter of every single sentence begins with a capital letter now. So the capital I, Y, and S. At the end of these sentences, I added in what's called a period. So that little dot, that's what it's called, period. And that period indicates that this is the end of that idea. And it's a very tiny punctuation mark, as you can see, but you're going to make the reader's job so much easier by letting them know when your idea finishes so that the next sentence that begins is another idea. So chunking your information for your reader makes that writing, again, easier to sift through, as you can see here. So we're up to about a level four. Again, read your two sentences to yourself, please, first, and see if you can understand more about the ideas. We're getting there, right? Bit by bit. And that's the whole point. We're, we're scaffolding our steps. We're adding on as we go. So I still see some, some little grammar and writing mistakes that we could fix. But the point we're making here is the fact that we've separated two ideas out. We've got basically two sentences. We've started each of these sentences with a capital letter. So I circled those for you. And again, as important here, really important, we've added that end punctuation mark. Now in English, sometimes you might have different end punctuation marks. You could have a question mark, an exclamation mark, and so on. And that's fine, depending on how you use it. But I would say the period is the most common way to end a sentence, and you'll likely be using it the most. So that's why we've used the period here, just to keep it easy and simple. So those are your foundational skills. These are sort of beginner level. And now we're starting to work our way into closer to the intermediate level anyway. So if you've already got this simple sentence structure with that subject verb object, you've got your capitals and end punctuation in place, you're now ready to start taking those short, simple sentences and connecting them together to create longer, more complex structures. And on your self pip test, the more complexity you can demonstrate, the better your score is going to be under this readability section. So those connecting words, so that joining word we're going to use to connect the sentence, 
Those words are called conjunctions. So I've got that word on screen for you in case you've never heard it before. So if you hear me say later a conjunction, what I'm talking about is the connecting word. That's what we call them from a grammar standpoint. So let's show how we can start connecting these short, simple ideas together. So you can still see the exact same three simple sentences here on the left-hand side of my examples. But what you'll now notice is I've added in a conjunction. So these are the joining words. These are the words that are bolded or darkened in the middle of each of these three sentences. And what I've attached to the other side of that conjunction is another short, simple idea. So I'll read that first example aloud and you'll see how it flows together. So I eat apples, but I don't like pears. So those two sentences, I eat apples, I don't like pears. Those are complete by themselves. They're both simple sentence structure, but we connected them together using that conjunction, but. The word but means an opposite, and that's why I chose that particular word. So I'm looking at something I do eat and something I don't eat. Those are opposite constructions, so but just makes sense. In my second example, we've got you read books and I write poems. So again, two different sentences, but connected together using the word and. And and is a very common word. It connects similar ideas. So we're looking at activities that we both do. So that's why and makes sense here. Last but not least, we've got she cooks dinner, then she rests. So those are two different sentences, but we've connected them together through sequence. We're looking at, I guess, what we do first and what we do second. So these are, uh, again, ways to connect ideas using conjunctions. So really important skill to have. So I'm going to show you a self at level five. This is actually pretty high level, even for level five, I have to say. Read the sentence through, and I think you'll have no trouble understanding it. So it's a lot clearer, wouldn't you say, than we started with our, our level two for a variety of reasons. We've got that subject verb object, but we've also got a capital letter to start the sentence, and we've got a period right at the very end. What this writer has very cleverly done has created three different ideas, and I'd like to underline them for you now in different colors so we can easily see how these ideas are, are associated. Okay, so I, looking at the sentence the way it is, I know that the yellow phrase in the middle here of the sentence, it says, I list down all items that I need to buy. That to me looks like the main part of the entire sentence. That's the main idea. And what this person has done is connected the red part of the sentence and the green part of the sentence together to the yellow section using two different conjunctions. They've chosen before and and. And again, both of these words make sense in the context. So I guess there are two steps to, to experiment with when we're learning how to connect these structures together. First of all, we need to, again, understand the simple syntax, look at ways to connect them, but we really do need to learn the meanings of these words. Right, so before I go to the grocery is clearly a time sequence. Again, there's a huge list of conjunctions. I won't get into them now, but if you are looking to study this further, it would be something for you to, to be familiar with. There are probably about 12 or 14 conjunctions that are very common in English. I'd, I'd encourage you to learn those first, and then you can step it up to higher level ones, which I'll show you when we get to the advanced. But this is really high level. This is actually compound complex sentence structure. So even for level five, I'm, I'm impressed. We don't always see this at the level five, but well done. There are a few little other grammar and writing mistakes that we would want to fix. But by level five, we're getting into sort of that high beginner, even approaching intermediate. So those four skills are, I guess, foundational in a way. And if you've already understood and practiced connecting ideas together, like we just looked at, you're now ready to learn the proper rules of paragraphs. So I'm going to show you a level six example, and you'll notice right off the top that it's a lot longer than the other examples we were looking at. And the reason for that is because paragraphs themselves are actually groups of sentences. So I'm showing you right now two different paragraphs instead of just looking at the basic construction of a sentence. So before we read this through together, and I'm going to ask you some questions about it, so be prepared to answer in the chat box. I wanted to make sure everybody understands what I mean when I say paragraph. This might be something that's a bit new for some of our viewers. So you'll notice, first of all, if you were typing into the computer screen, every single line that we type, it starts on the left-hand margin. This is called the margin or the edge of the screen. So everything there starts along the left-hand side. Again, we type, it looks to me like I've got one sentence, I see the period, 
capital letter and period. So we've got two sentences here, but you'll notice there's an empty space here or a line that's left blank. And then we started a new paragraph. This is paragraph number two. And again, looking at my capitals and my end punctuation, there's the period. And again, here is the new sentence starting and the period. So it looks like I've got two sentences here as well. So the rules for paragraphs tell us that in one paragraph alone, you're only allowed to talk about one main idea. So you'll present that main idea and all the sentences that are contained in that same paragraph are going to be giving details about that main idea. And the moment you have a different main idea, that's when you start a different paragraph. So what I'd like to do to test this theory out and see how our, our level six test taker did, I'm actually going to read aloud this first paragraph to you. And I'd like you to try to identify for me in the chat box if you can, what the main focus of this first paragraph is all about. So here it is, it says, this is to inform you that I had a problem regarding the stuff that I bought in your grocery store earlier. I checked my receipt and realized that one of your cashiers overcharged me for several items that were supposed to be cheaper. So I'll pause there. All right, take a moment to try to understand what the focus of this paragraph is all about. This might be a hard question to answer, so we might not get any guesses in the chat box. But I'll give you a moment to see if you'd like to add something to the chat box, and Ashwadi can read it out then if we get any ideas. I can't see your, your comments coming in as I'm presenting, by the way, so I will rely on Ashwadi if we get any. But again, the whole response is going to answer the question from the test. So the whole thing is about the grocery store items. But if we're going to start paragraphing our work, we do have to understand that the specific focus of each. Okay. Yeah, what do we have? Yeah. So we've got one, I think the suggestions are coming in, but for now we've got one. Uh, paragraph one main idea is uh, details of a problem at a grocery. Yeah, perfect. Whoever said that, you nailed it. Like it's it's nice in your own mind just to have a simple understanding of what we're talking about. And this is probably the introductory paragraph anyway, but literally this whole paragraph, all it does is it identifies the problem. That is it. That is the whole purpose here. You've got it. That's exactly correct. The problem is, is that I was overcharged. So that's yeah. what we've clearly identified there. Awesome. Did we have any other ideas to add? Yes. No, I mean, well, they're all the same. The other Good. one said problem statement or introduction. Excellent. 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 Yeah. So now overcharged by cashier. Awesome. Yep. All of those ideas mean the same thing. Great. So I'm really glad you were able to identify the focus. So once we've identified the problem, which is being overcharged, because we have a new paragraph, I'll read this out loud to you now, and I'd like you to see if you can identify, it's a slightly different focus. We're not just focusing on the problem of being overcharged anymore. So type into the chat box what we're talking about here. So this one says, I tried to phone your store to get it fixed, and they said that I needed to go back today to fix it. My problem is the store is an hour drive away from my house and I have an important meeting to attend. And I have no idea how long that will take. There we go. Slightly different focus. We're still talking about the grocery store. That will always be the case through the whole email because that's the test question. But this paragraph is focusing on something different. We're not just talking about the problem anymore. What are we talking about in this paragraph? When you have a problem, what are you hoping to do about that problem? You would want to? <laughs> Any ideas? Hi. Um, we've got one that says solution. Yeah. Um, another one that says resolving the issue. Perfect. And then, uh, resolutions. Then uh, another one says, oops, another one says, difficulty with the resolution offered by the store. Excellent. All of those ideas are wonderful. So this paragraph in very simple terms is about what the problem is. This paragraph is focusing more on how can we fix it. So you're right. We, we haven't actually truly found the solution yet, but this paragraph is introducing different ideas. So I, you know, I phone them to fix it. They want me to come in. I can't. So we're working through that problem. Excellent. So you, can you see how these two ideas are slightly different? The whole thing is about the uh, the issue at the grocery store that's important to note 
but each paragraph has an entirely different focus. And those are the rows of paragraph skills. So we're emerging into the intermediate level where that is evident. So if you are not yet paragraphing your own work in your writing, this is something I'd love for you to experiment with at home. On the CELPIP test, your, your paragraphs don't have to be all that long. These sentences are longer anyway, but two to three, even four sentences in one paragraph would be enough on the CELPIP test. You've only got 200 words to write anyway. So this is a really good example, I think, to look at to see how paragraph skills are emerging. Excellent. I'm glad you were able to identify those, those main points for us. So we're adding on now, and we're getting up into that intermediate level. So this is your, your fifth of six writing skills to come your way today. And we're looking at simply making our sentence structures and our verb tenses and such more complex. So by now, we already know how to connect ideas together to create these longer sentences, but we're just going to try to step it up a little bit and show more complexity and sophistication. So here's your level seven. What I'd like to do, I'm going to read this out loud to you, and I'm hoping that you're going to be able to identify for us there are three different conjunctions here. So three different words that are being used to connect the ideas within the sentences. So as I'm reading this out loud, try to identify those words, type them into our chat box and we'll share. So again, more work with those constructions. So this one says, I am writing this letter to you because I have a problem that cannot be solved by only call the store sales. I guess they mean by only calling the store. I bought some food and snacks in your grocery store this afternoon, but I realized that I was overcharged for one bottle of juice and a box of chips after I arrived home. Lots of interesting detail there. Anyway, we're not looking at the detail today, although I'd love to, <laughs> but that would be confusing. Let's focus on just the writing skills. So we're looking at our sentence structure and I do see evidence of some complexity emerging. Can you find for me at least one of those conjunctions? If you found all three, even better. So I'll give you a moment to share those thoughts in the chat box. We'll see if we have a list. There are only three conjunctions, not four, three. Hello, <clears throat> excuse me. Mm -hmm. um, so we've got because, by, and, but. Close, oh. two out of three of those are correct. Do you know which ones? Because, but, after. You got it. Whoever said that, you got it. Yeah. Here's our first one, right? So I'm writing this letter to you because I have a problem that I can't solve. The word because gives a reason, right? So those two ideas are being connected that way. Why am after, I writing? Because. Mm -hmm. Sorry, to be honest, like just to clarify, the first person also said after. I just thought he was <laughs> like, I just thought they were saying something else. So it's because by and but after. Okay, so by is not a um, is not a conjunction in the true sense of the word, yeah, in this case. So if you're looking at just the sentence structure, we've got because, we've also got but. So over here, that word but again means that opposite. So they're saying, you know, I bought these things, but I was overcharged. So that's how those ideas fit together. The one that I'm impressed you noticed is this one here at the end. The word after does actually work as a conjunction because it's giving you information more about the time sequence, the order of events. So I guess they noticed the overchargement. Is that a word? They noticed they were overcharged after they got home. Yeah. So three different ways to connect ideas. So interestingly enough here, you've only got, I think, two sentences. Yes. So capital letter period, that's sentence number one. So we've got two different sentences here. We've connected them together using because. The word because is considered, it's a higher level conjunction. It's technically called a subordinating conjunction. When we use it, it creates a complex sentence structure. So that's what this first sentence is. Over here, you've got idea number one. This word connects that thought to idea number two. This word connects it to idea number three. So we do have three separate ideas, two different conjunctions. This sentence is a compound complex sentence structure. So see what I mean by just playing around with your con connections? There's many ways you could connect these sentences. You could probably rearrange and use different words and have the same overall meaning. But you're now experimenting with different ways to connect thoughts rather than just use and, but, so. Those three conjunctions are, are helpful in a sense, but they're simple. And the readers are looking for you to demonstrate a good variety. So we've got different words here and we're aiming for that higher level as well. Level eight is going to demonstrate all of these wonderful skills we've been talking about, 
But again, it's just going to step up the complexity. It's going to show a more consistent control over these complex structures and might even have a, a bigger variety as well. So just for time's sake, if you don't mind, I'll read this example to you. And I'm just going to circle the conjunctions as we find them. And you'll see for yourself, I think that we've got some higher level ones here that weren't used earlier. So we start here with, unfortunately, I could not visit your store within the day because it takes an hour to drive, I guess, from our home. Moreover, I need to go to work this afternoon. Since I already gave you the full details of my credit card, it would be great if you could transfer the refunded amount back to my card. I'm willing to wait for a couple of days. Okay, so again, a couple of little tiny grammar writing mistakes you might have noticed. I corrected them as I spoke aloud. But you can start to see again emerging complexity, even using the word if, if suggests a, a conditional. It's something that you're imagining anyway. So it is showing slightly higher level thoughts. And beyond just experimenting with your sentence structures, you're also, I'm hoping, going to start looking at the verb tenses that you're using in your writing. So I've gone ahead and highlighted in yellow the different verb tenses in the level seven versus the level eight. So up top in level seven, oh, the grammar there looks fine to me. There's nothing wrong with it. But you'll notice that the verb tenses are pretty much simple. I have, that's simple present. I realized, I was overcharged, I arrived. Those are simple past tense verbs. So again, the grammar is fine, but we're still demonstrating sort of a, it's a, a one trick pony. <laughs> that's a, an awful expression that means. It's just kind of the same all the way through. Level eight plays around a bit more with some higher level constructions. I could not visit, that's a negative, but it's also an infinitive. I see present and past tenses. I see simpler things like it gives and I gave, but I'm also seeing these infinitive verbs, like I need to go to work. Uh, again, we have a conditional with that if. It would be great if you could transfer. That's much higher level, as you can see, versus up top where we say, I have a problem. <clears throat> Even in the bottom line of level eight, I am willing to wait. This is now a continuous verb tense. All right, so again, I'm not asking you to forcibly put different verb tenses into your writing to impress the readers. That's not at all what we want to do. We want to learn how to use different verb tenses and use the ones that are appropriate to the situation. So again, the more variety that you can demonstrate and also the more complexity you can demonstrate, it's going to help with this readability score under your, um, under your assessment. So something to think on. Okay, so now by the time we get to level nine, we are well on our way into that intermediate or upper intermediate level. Level nine is that coveted score. I do a ton of online webinars each month on Zoom for people around the world that want to learn more about self -hip. And I'd say 90% of the people who take my webinars are probably applying for their permanent residency status in Canada. So if that's your situation, you're probably looking to achieve at least a level nine on your test, because as you know, you'll earn more points towards your immigration pathways. So again, level nine is something that people strive or, or aim to, to meet as a goal. So I thought it would be helpful if we examined this. Do you want to read the level nine to yourself? Just have a look through. I don't think you'll have trouble understanding. The grammar is pretty strong. So read it through. I'll give you about 15 seconds. All right. Not bad, level nine, whoever wrote this. So I'm just going to quickly point out, again, we're seeing all the same skills. We're still seeing the syntax and the conjunctions and so on. But what I'm noticing as I start reading this is again, I'm noticing higher level constructs yet again. So now we're using, looks to me like a present perfect verb tense. So again, not just simple past or simple present, we're experimenting with the present, or I mean with the perfect verb tenses. Those are harder to create and do them well. I also notice right here, You'll notice the words to the grocery store. It's been written inside those curved lines. And from a grammar standpoint, we call those curved lines parentheses. It's a fancy word, isn't it? So this whole phrase, here's another fancy term. We can call this a parenthetical reference. We sound so smart when we say that out loud, don't we? All a parenthetical reference is doing is giving you a little bit of more information about the idea that comes before. So when this person wrote that, the store manager instructed him to come back. He put in brackets to the grocery store. So he's just explaining to the reader that that's what was meant when the manager gave those instructions. So again, as you can imagine, this is showing a slightly higher level way to uh, approach your ideas, giving more variety as well and doing it correctly. 
I'm also noticing over here, this is um, when we add information on using those words, which or that or who, these words, uh, the whole phrase itself would be called a relative clause. And we add these ideas in simply to give more detail about the person or the thing that we're talking about. And when we use these words, we are creating a complex structure as well. So these are all just like, I would call these the icing on the cake, if you will. So once you've got your basic standard sentence, start looking at ways that you can add those details in using some of these techniques. All right, we have to know how to do it well or properly, but they will add that variety and that complexity to the writing. So that's your level nine. If you are already getting the hang of some of those higher level constructs, you are now ready for what I would present as almost the, the final stage, or at least the final one we're going to talk about today. You're going to refine or fine tune your writing. You're going to polish it up and make sure it's the best it can be before you submit it for marks. And to do that, I would recommend that you look for ways to add transitions within your writing. Now, remember earlier, I used that big word conjunctions, and we've looked at lots of examples of those joining words, like because, and, but. Conjunctions do connect ideas, and transitions also connect ideas, but they're done in different ways. So to show you exactly what I mean, let's quickly look at one last example today of conjunctions. So I'll read that this is just a, a couple sentences I wrote myself, by the way, just to give us a sense of what conjunctions are about. So this is what I think we already know from today's episode. It's a review. So it says here, I bought some snacks in your store, but I was overcharged. So we've seen ideas like that earlier, right? We've used that conjunction, but to connect those two ideas together. And in my second sentence, I've written, my total bill was $18.17 when it should have been $14. So again, I chose that conjunction when and I connected those two ideas together in, in the two sentences there. So we hopefully know how to do that by now, by the advanced level of our writing. We're going to add in a transition now right here. So transitions are going to connect ideas, but instead of connecting ideas within one sentence, we're looking at ways to connect all of the sentences together smoothly within a paragraph. That's basically what transitions do. So I'd like to show you a couple examples of transitions that would fit right where I'm pointing and that are going to help us understand the relationship between these two sentences as a whole. All right, so there it is in yellow, so we can easily identify the transition. And for transitions to, to make sense, we really have to read the whole thing from beginning to end. So you can see how they connect. So again, this whole thing now reads, I bought some snacks in your store, but I was overcharged. In fact, my total bill was $18.17 when it should have been $14. Or if you'd like, you could use a different transition. To my surprise, my total bill was $18.17 when it should have been $14. So you've got lots of choice, but transitions are often, sometimes they're one word, oftentimes they're little groups of words, as you can see here. But their purpose is, again, to connect the ideas within a paragraph. And that's what makes them sort of that last step, because it's harder to do this, right? You're not just looking at one sentence at a time. You're looking at ways to connect the ideas as a group. So let's try this one last time. I'll read. This is level 10 now. Again, it's a longer paragraph, which is part and parcel of the advanced level writer. They're usually able to write longer text as well. So I'll read the whole paragraph out loud. And I'm going to let you know right now that there are five transitions. So I'm hoping you can identify at least a couple of them. So feel free to type them into the chat box as soon as you hear me say them out loud. If you can't catch all five, that's okay. But let's see if we can catch at least a few of them. Okay, so to be clear, I'm not looking for conjunctions. We're not looking for words like because and so we're looking for transitions, words that are connecting ideas. So it starts off here, it says, I called your store as soon as I noticed the difference, and the only option provided to me was to come back to the store to resolve the matter. Unfortunately, I live in Bolton, and your store is an hour drive away. I have prior appointments with family and would not be able to make it to your store today. Also, driving for one hour any other day in the near future to resolve this matter is not a very palatable solution. As you realize, it takes two hours of commuting back and forth. All right. Again, you'll notice there were a few writing errors. I just corrected them as I spoke aloud. And that's okay. We don't mind a few little errors here and there. But let's see how we did with the transitions. Hello. Yeah. 
Um, we've got one comment. I think comments are coming in, but the first one says as soon as. <clears throat> and then there is unfortunately also, as you realize, um, the next person got all of them as soon as, unfortunately, also, as we realize, two, three, four. I'm more. Um, more. Unfortunately, and then also, huh, what are we missing? Guess what? Oftentimes, transitions, they're deceptive because sometimes they have to do with time sequences. So I think of these as transitions as well. When you're adding in little tiny phrases that tell you when events happened in relationship. Oh, Sorry? I didn't hear. Is you. it in the near future? Is that yeah. the, yeah. Yeah. in yeah. the yeah. near future? Perfect. Yeah. And again, so in the near future, that's also a prepositional phrase, right? So the word in is a preposition. It gives us information about time or place. So I can understand maybe why people wouldn't identify that as a transition if you're thinking of your elements of grammar. But just think of a transition as any word or even a little phrase or group of words that are just connecting these ideas together. And I think sequencing your events so you know what happened first or what will happen later, I think those are also very effective transitions and ways to connect the story together. So well done for you to get the transitions that quickly. I'm actually, I'm very impressed. These are advanced level skills. So well done there. Do we have any other questions or comments before we move on? Um, we don't have any questions that are related to this. Okay. And we'll get to those later. You have somebody suggest earlier when you were talking about in fact and to my surprise, somebody suggested I was shocked to see that as a possible transition. <clears throat> uh, I was shocked to see that is a sentence all by itself. Yeah. So you know what? That's actually a fair question. So you always have choice in, in English. If you wanted to just write a different sentence conveying the idea, that's fine. But a transition will be just a group of words. So you can see these five circled examples of transitions. None of them are sentences by themselves. So none of them have a subject or a verb. But when you say, I was also shocked to see my bill or something, you're, you're actually inventing the subject and the verb. So that's not a transition. It's helpful for your sentence for sure, but it just doesn't work the same as a transition, if that makes any sense. Yeah, good question. Very good question. But if I'm looking at these five examples, I'm noticing that three of them happen to start my sentence. And it's, it's easy to see the starting because of the capital, capital letter U, A and A, right? So we're starting a new sentence. So oftentimes a transition can go there. Unfortunately, would work as a transition because you're showing, unfortunately means something negative. So once you've identified something that's happened, you're following that up with sort of a, a negative consequence. So that's how this word alone identifies the relationship between this sentence and that sentence. And that's what a transition does. Sometimes you can put those transitions in the middle of your sentences, as you can see here as well. So again, there's lots of choice. Transitions can be tricky. I always suggest don't overthink it. Don't just use a transition for the sake of using a transition, but just look at your writing once you've typed it out on your computer screen. I'm hoping you're saving yourself at least two or three minutes on your clock on the test to go back and read the whole thing from start to finish. This is what I do. And for me, I'll notice, oh shoot, I don't have really any transitions in this paragraph. So if you read the whole thing all the way through, you can start to see where you can just add a little phrase here and there and just make it smoother. That's polishing the work and that's an effective thing to do as you're proofreading your work anyway. Nice, okay. I don't wanna spend a lot of time on levels 11 and 12, but I know you're probably curious to see how they compare. So here's your level 11. Uh, maybe if you wanted to just read this one to yourself, I'll give you about 15 seconds and then I'll quickly identify the transitions on screen. So see if you can find your own transitions as you're reading through. All right. Not bad. Level 11. This is advanced level, by the way. So again, we maybe are not all today working at an advanced level, but it's fun to look at, <laughs> gives us ideas. I noticed the first three are obvious transitions. I went ahead and highlighted that bottom phrase because I honestly felt that even though that's half the sentence, I felt like it was an effective detail that really connected everything together because we're talking about the drive and how long it's going to take. So I thought that was just a very clever way to put that idea in the middle of the sentence. 
So it might not be a transition in the true sense, but I think it does help to bridge those ideas. So not bad. And again, they're longer too. So not surprising at level 11. Your level 12, let's have a look here, just to compare. I'll maybe read this one out loud, just because there's a couple of words that might be tricky. We've got, as soon as I realized this mistake, I phoned your store, or I spoke to your customer services representative. She explained that if I returned to the store tomorrow, they would rectify the matter by refunding me the discounted amount. However, as I explained on the telephone, I live an hour's drive away and it isn't practical for me to return before my next planned shopping trip next month, by which time your discount offer will have expired. That whole last sentence is grammatically correct and I see a ton of complex structures. Excellent writing here. This is of course advanced, right? So very quickly, we've got again, a good variety of transitions and more complex ideas happening. I love that phrase when they say, however, that's a great transition anyway. But when they say, as I explained on the telephone, and then they continue. So that's what I mean by just adding in these extra little ideas that help to bridge all of your sentences together and make them flow smoothly. So cell PIP level 11 and 12 are both considered advanced. I'd say that the main difference between them is that when you look at 11, it's got a broad range of these complex structures. So a variety of transitions, just from a grammar standpoint as well, I'm seeing lots of different constructs there in verb tenses. Level 12 just steps it up a slight notch. It has a very broad range, probably more, maybe longer sentences, but on the whole more complex. A level 12 writer as well, generally has their own personal style of writing and they're able to adjust their style and their tone to fit the question. So again, looking at 11 and 12, I don't think it's the length that differentiates the, the different levels. I think it has more to do with just that little tiny nudge for level 12 that makes it just slightly more complex. Particularly if you look at that last sentence, it starts with however, and it finishes down at the bottom with have expired. If you just counted all the different types of, of complex grammatical structures there, you'd be very impressed. So in a nutshell, anyway, that's what advanced level writing looks like. So I'll just summarize the steps we've done, and then I'll come back and take some questions if you've got any for me today. So we did look at these exact six steps for your effective writing. And this is applicable to the cell pit test, yes, but also to your daily writing. So I don't know what other writing you might be doing on the side. You might be writing for work. Some of you might be writing for fun as a leisure or hobby activity. So these six steps will apply to writing in general not just for the self pit test. And I think that's that's important to note. So the first thing, just as a recap, is your syntax. So we have to, for English, understand that we're looking at subject, verb, object. That's a really important order to remember. And then once you've done that, you're going to add your capital letters to begin a sentence. You're going to put an end punctuation mark right at the end, usually a period. You can then start adding in your conjunctions for step three. So look for ways to take those short, simple sentences and connect them together with the right joining word. And once you've got that, you can paragraph the ideas. So remember one paragraph talks about one main idea. When you begin a new main idea, you're going to start a new paragraph. It helps your reader out so much to do it that way. And once you've got those basic skills, I would call those pretty foundational. The complex structures then are fine tuning where you're getting more into that intermediate level by this stage. So look for different connecting words, but strive for higher level words rather than just and, but so try to show more interest, more variety in the writing and look at ways to maybe take even three different sentences and connecting them together into one as we saw examples today. Last but not least, your transitions are helpful just to polish the, the writing. Again, it helps your reader understand the relationship between all of the ideas within that paragraph. And sometimes even you can add transitions to connect different paragraphs together. So rather than have the reader try to make sense of it themselves, you're doing the work for them, which you should be doing. You're the writer of the piece by adding in these connecting words. So you're polishing off the work. And again, transitions would be evidence, I would say, of an of a upper intermediate, even advanced level. So I listed it last in our list there. Anyway, I'm going to take my presentation off. I'll come back over to you and let's see if we've got any questions. I threw a lot of information at you, so you might have some questions for me. Let's see today. <laughs> yes, um, we have questions. Uh, the first one was a little bit ahead. I'm gonna go, 
I'm not flowing. Who was the first question? Okay, yeah. So the first question is regarding readability, would a very long sentence with potentially unwieldy complex but grammatically correct connections lead to a lower mark? Good <laughs> question, Philippe. I'm actually glad you've asked this. So maybe I maybe I hope I didn't mislead anybody when I was explaining this earlier. So thank you for clarifying. So remember, for your readability on the CELPIP test, the raters do want to see a variety of sentence structures. So again, if you've got some complex structures and some compound complex ideas and using different verb tenses, all of those things are very helpful. They demonstrate to the raters that you've got a, a deeper knowledge of all of these tools and you're demonstrating your best skills. Even if that is the case though, even if you had, say, I'm going to exaggerate, let's pretend you had eight different sentences or eight different ideas, and you somehow found a way to connect them all into one gigantic sentence. Even if you did use the correct conjunctions and transitions, you're going to overload the reader, right? I mean, who wants to read a sentence that starts here and ends way down here? By the time you get halfway down the paragraph, you probably are already lost. So yeah, longer is not necessarily better. So don't overload your sentences just to try to make them complex. That would be the wrong way to approach this. Always try to give like a focused bite-sized information, enough information that the reader can follow, but end that sentence and start a new one where necessary so that you're not overwhelming them. Because you don't want to confuse the reader, not especially for self it when the readers are giving you a score. But in general, yeah, excellent question. There's not really a rule for how many phrases you can connect. I, I always said as a rule of thumb, I think three is probably a, a lot, <laughs> three to four. And then anything beyond that, I think you'd probably better end off and then just start fresh. But yeah, you'll know when you read it back to yourself, if you're finding it long to follow, you'll know you've got too much and you'll need to find a way to end something and then start fresh. Excellent question, Philippe. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, thank you for that. We have another question and this was, um, this was, this has been asked by more than one person. It's about having to use, like, do I need to use a comma before a conjunction? Some conjunctions, yes, and others, no. So I didn't turn this into a big lesson today. Maybe someday I'll do a mini lesson on conjunction use. Uh, but there are actually about three different groups of conjunctions. And the basic ones, like and, but, so, they go in the middle of the sentence. And yes, you would put a comma before them. But other groups of conjunctions, like because, after, although, if they're in the middle of a sentence, they don't need a comma. So yeah, there's there's some really sort of uh, particular rules you need to learn and memorize about conjunction use. And I, again, I didn't get into those today as I didn't want to overwhelm you. But yeah, just know that you do sometimes use a comma, but sometimes not. Again, we'll maybe do a lesson on that another day. Or you could Google okay. it at any time. <laughs> Is it the same uh, case for transitions? Yeah, so transitions, I, I'm just thinking back in off the top. We have, I think most transitions, you would put a comma after that transition, wouldn't you? Like also, mm -hmm. comma, and then you have your idea. Oh, but not always. Yeah, like because in one or two was one transition, and I don't think... Yeah. One, and as soon as, like, I call the store as soon as I realize, like, that wouldn't take a transition, yeah. It has to do more with um, the clauses or, or the phrases, the groups of words you have. So we generally use a comma to separate the different clauses, one from the next. But if your mm -hmm. transition is part of that main idea, then no. You don't want to interrupt the main thought, right? Yeah. Yeah. Also, ending with an article. So, like, in order to, as soon as, are they articles or prepositions? Uh, uh, yeah, they're not articles. In order okay. to, yeah. Yeah, so you wouldn't use a comma there. Yeah. If it's ending yeah, with an sorry. article, maybe you wouldn't need use a comma. Yeah. Like, also, also is a good, in addition to, or additionally, like that one you would, additionally, comma. Mm -hmm. I'd like to know more about blah, 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 blah. Yeah, so it's kind of... But then you can use it for in addition to. In addition to. In addition to, because there's, there's an expectation that there's something coming after that article. Yeah. yeah, so you wouldn't use a comma there, yeah. In addition to the lesson that we did today, comma, we're yeah. going to add on a lesson about conjunctions next week. So again, the comma is going to go after you've completed the thought. Can you think of it that way in simple terms? This would be easier if I have examples on screen. You wouldn't just go in addition to comma, blah, 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 because you, you're not finished speaking. As Ashwadi says, you're expecting the rest of the idea to be at least addressed. And then, yeah. So think of the comma as the natural pause where you're done delivering that first bit of information. And then the next bit's going to come. Maybe that for now, for simple terms, that will help a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So 
So that was the transitions. Uh, my question is related to the survey question. Is it ideal to start and end the writing for a survey question like we do for emails? Yeah, so remember today, the practice question we looked at it just happened to be an email task for writing task one. For self-it task two is all, it's going to give you a survey to complete and you have to present your opinion and support it with reasons why you feel that way. You have the choice. So yes, Helen, you can use the email structure if you wish, but you don't have to. You can just decide to structure it in different paragraphs and just simply state your opinion in the first sentence. And then each paragraph is going to discuss the different reasons why. So you've got the choice, whatever your own preference and style of writing would be. And it's not going to affect your score either way. What will affect your score, as we looked at today, is your actual grammar, your writing, your sentence structure, your ability to paragraph, and then all those other elements from the checklist we didn't even talk about today, like your vocabulary and your content details and so on. Yeah, but feel free to choose email, to email or not to email, doesn't matter. <laughs> you can do it either way for task two. Um, great. <clears throat> do we lose marks on spelling mistakes? Well, if you're spelling words to the point where we honestly have no idea what the word is, then yes, right? If you're just making an, the odd little spelling mistake here and there, maybe you forgot the E at the end of a word, for example. Provided we can understand the word you mean, it doesn't affect our ability to understand, and you don't make a mistake in every single sentence, then I wouldn't worry so much about it. Yeah, spelling's important, but it's not the most important skill. It's so much more important to have syntax, sentence structure, paragraphs and so on and so on. There is a spell check on self -hit. Did you know that as well? So if you're typing something on the computer screen and the computer just doesn't recognize it, it's going to underline the word in red for you, just like it would if, if you were typing in a Microsoft Word document. So you could right click with your mouse on the test and the computer is gonna pop open a, a little list of suggested words it thinks you might have meant to say. So it'll help you at least identify that there might be a mistake or not. You still have to figure out which word you want to change it to but at least you're getting a slight helping hand there. So yeah, it's fair. It's worth knowing that, I think. But also it won't like, it won't pick out words that you've misspelled, but then are also words in their own right. Yeah. So like if you wrote, if you meant to say quite, but you said quiet instead, it's not going to pick it up because quiet and quite are both the same, are existing yeah. words and they're not mistakes. Right. So it's a mistake right. in the context. Right. Yeah. Like stuff and staff, like these words are very easily confused, right? Yeah. So the computer's not that smart. <laughs> That's up to you to catch and fix yourself. Yeah. Good point. Okay. Um, we had another question. Okay. With conjunctions, can we keep two main ideas in a single paragraph? Yeah. Like two different clauses together or even three. So remember that level five example I, sh I shared with you and I underlined in, in three different colors. I think we had yellow, red, and green. So that was one compound complex sentence constructed correctly with three different main clauses or ideas. So yeah, that would be one sentence. And then if you had say two or three sentences like that all in the same paragraph, as long as those sentences all talked about the same main idea, then yes, that's exactly what you should be doing. But the moment you have a new main idea, it's a new paragraph. Yeah. I think that's what they're asking. Like, I, get, I mean, if you're still watching, please clarify. But then the question is, with conjunctions, can we keep two main two main ideas in a single paragraph? Oh, I misunderstood. Can we use the conjunction to to transition between from one main idea to another main idea? No. no. Yeah. So in your paragraphs, again, the whole purpose of, of having a paragraph is to put that one main idea there. If it's a new main idea, it's a new paragraph. So don't just throw in a connecting word and, and block it all into the same. When you do it that way, you end up making your reader work extra hard because they have to figure out, wait a minute, we were just talking about a problem and now all of a sudden I'm unsolving. Like, how did we get from here to here? I'm in the same paragraph, right? So don't confuse your reader by mixing and matching your ideas. Always chunk it out, leaving empty spaces between the ideas so it's clear when you're beginning and ending. Yeah. Thanks for clarifying, Ishwadi. I read that too fast, I guess. Um, no problem. Um, okay. Can we use pointers? Uh, I'm not sure you mean to be honest. What's, what's a pointer? Maybe if you could just clarify and then I, I'll know what you mean. I don't know what you mean. You okay. Um, yeah, we'll wait for that. Okay. Somebody asked, okay, so this is a question regarding spellings and how they're different with UK and US. Um, okay, but then I, I can't, okay, there it is. 
excuse me, is it realized with an S or realized with a Z? Doesn't really matter. Yeah, one's Canadian, one's American. And honestly, off the top of my head, I think the Z's Canadian, isn't it, Ashwani? I have to look that up myself because it's such an unimportant point. Yeah, it doesn't really matter. It's Commonwealth because I think in India also we spell it as Z, Z, and then that's Commonwealth spelling. So, uh, yeah, I think Z is, yes, I think Z is. You know what? Because it doesn't matter as long as you speak to. Like stick to one spelling convention. Yeah, like yeah, I'm using yeah. American, use all American. Yeah, because I've always used the S myself. Like that, for whatever reason, that's just how I've always done it. But I notice when I'm typing into different documents, the computer underlines it in red because the S is not correct. So that's why it's American. American. Yeah. It's American. So the S must be American, and then the Z Canadian, which is what mm -hmm. I was in mind thinking. But again, doesn't matter. Yeah. We know what the word is. <laughs> Sorry, Ishwan. Computers don't recognize uh, Commonwealth spellings. They won't like even when I'm typing like uh, center, like we put C N T R E here, and it's always like this is like you know, there's always like an error thing, and it really bothers me because I don't like like nobody likes to see errors in their document. I'm like it's not an error, it's a word that exists. I know what I'm doing. Yeah, but um, again. Consistency is key, though, just to reiterate that. So if you always use an S, like all the way through, please continue to use the S or use always the Z. But don't start mixing them up because then it's a bit confusing. That's a good point. Uh, OK. So um, I, I don't think this question is for you. OK, this one. Can we give an example of the survey question? Excuse me. Can we give an example? Are you asking me to give you an example? or? I'm not really no, I think they're asking within their response, can they give an example? Yeah, absolutely. So again, we didn't talk about content details in today's episode as we were focusing on writing skills. But when you're presenting an opinion for your writing task too, you're going to be most successful by having very specific reasons why you feel that way. And I think a, a good reason to have would be to cite an example of a successful situation, right? So. Again, if I was trying to prove the, the practice question off the top of my head, I do in session with, with a lot of students is you've got this green space in the middle of town and the city wants to know what we should do with it. So if your opinion is we should turn that green space into um, a sports complex for the community, that's your opinion. I might say my reason would be it's going to promote physical health for the residents. And then I'll back that up with an example and say, for example, in the neighboring town of Sudbury, Ontario, a complex was built about five years ago, and already the instances of, of diabetes and heart disease has declined. I'm just making that up off the top of my head, but that's what you would do in your self test. So if you have the wherewithal and the desire to throw in such specific examples to back up what you're talking about, excellent. Those are very complex and detailed examples that are really going to help you out with your, uh, your content score. And probably to your vocab, if you can throw in all of those precise words. So yeah, the more precision, the better. So think of self pip as a test of, first of all, it has to make sense, that's step one, but then um, demonstrate your best skill set. Be as precise and interesting and descriptive as you can, would be my tip for task one and two. Okay. Um, okay, so we're getting more questions. Um, so I'll make sure to ask you. And then also we'll try to keep it short. Given that each paragraph should have one main idea, would it be a mark of more sophisticated use if this is implied instead of being explicitly stated in the topic? <clears throat> yeah, so we, we didn't look at the structure of paragraphs today as I think that would have been just too much for today's episode. But generally, because one paragraph is about one main idea, we're especially when we're just learning how to write paragraphs, we're often taught that your first sentence should be what's called a topic sentence as Philippe has just stated. So the topic sentence is going to directly identify the main idea. So again, when we're just learning how to do this, it's probably more common and easier to be very direct. So, you know, if you, I was writing this, this email task about being overcharged, if my very first sentence of my second paragraph says, you know, I've tried to solve this problem in a few ways. Maybe I said that first, and then I said, for instance, I called your store and was told that I needed to come back, blah, 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 blah. So that's a very direct statement of your topic sentence, which is fine. But I do agree with Philippe. I think that sometimes if we can imply the situation without coming 
or write out and directly stating it, I would argue that that tends to show a slightly higher level of sophistication and it takes practice. I don't really have the time to get into huge examples about that now, and it would be difficult to do without a question in front of us. But yeah, Philippe, it sounds to me like you probably are working already at the intermediate level getting into advanced. These are wonderful questions for you. If you aren't sure what a topic sentence is, don't worry about it right now. <laughs> You've got other skills to focus on. But yeah, that would show sophistication, I think, for sure. So we have uh, uh, two questions that uh, two people have asked the same question. Can you please give some tips to move from level eight to level nine? And I think it's uh, regarding the writing test. Okay. So again, remember to only look at writing skills like sentence structure, grammar, paragraph skills. So if you're looking at just that, we call that readability on that checklist. If you're just looking at readability, the main difference between levels eight and nine would be, again, more consistent and accurate use of those complex structures. So level eight grammar is just going to, it'll be correct, you'll understand it, but it's its going to lack that, that complexity that we saw in that level nine example. Remember, we got into the present perfect verb tenses and so on. So that's the readability section. But I think other main skills to look at for sure would be your content detail. Think back to that example I gave you about putting this green space in town. Remember that very precise example I threw your way about, hey, they built this complex in the neighboring town and the, the level of diabetes declined. So if you can come up with such precise details, you're definitely level nine or higher. A level eight writer, usually it's more simple. They might just gloss over. They might just say, you know, a, a green space in town would probably promote health and well-being. Yeah, good idea, but you're not taking the time to fully develop and extend that. So I think if you look at, if you do a lot of our, our webinars, we offer speaking and writing webinars online where we look a lot at levels eight and level nine, you're going to start to see the difference in the level of detail provided for both. So level nine is going to show more complexity and a longer extension of discussion for the details. And the vocab is part and parcel of that. So level eight writing tends to showcase more what I call common everyday or simpler language. So it would be more common to see words like person, thing, stuff, and so on, right, at the level eight. But level nine, we're, we're trying to step it up. So it's not just a person we're talking about. In this case, maybe it's a um, it's the restaurant manager. That's who I'm writing to in the first place, or the store manager, right? So again, it's always about precision and pushing yourself to go that extra mile with the more detail. The more information you can convey and the more precise and accurate you are, the higher your score is going to be anyway. Yeah, so those are some key features you can work on for now. <laughs> um, okay, so I think this is the last question. Can we use semicolon? Um, oh God, I lost the question. But basically, can we use semicolon in a sentence? Can yeah, absolutely. I didn't show you the semicolon today, as again, I didn't want to overload you. A semicolon, by the way, it, it looks like this. I can't do it on screen, but it looks like a, like a period at the top and a comma right below it. So you can see where my fingers are, like this one would be the period, this one would be the comma, and they're one on top and button below each other. The semicolon ends the sentence before, and then a brand new sentence begins on the other side, but the semicolon is used instead of the full stop or the period, usually because those two sentences are so closely connected and in meaning. So for example, if I were to say, it's going to rain today, I should bring an umbrella. Those ideas are just so clearly connected an idea I might just throw a semicolon to separate them instead of a period. Thank you, Karishma. Yeah, that's exactly what a semicolon looks like. Thank you for doing that. Yeah. A wink emoji. Yeah. Yeah, it is kind of like a winking emoji. Yeah. <laughs> Good point. But the one thing you need to remember if you're going to get fancy, and please do use semicolons when you can, because again, you're showing the readers that you've got different grammatical structures that you know and you know how to use. And the readers love to see that. It will help your score. But if you're going to use the semicolon, you do not put a capital letter on the next sentence that follows. That's the one rule you have to memorize. Mm -hmm. Unless the word is I or a person's name or something, names always have capitals no matter what. But if it's just two ideas with the semicolon, there's no capital on that next sentence. So that's just a rule you'll have to memorize. Yeah, great question, Karishma. Thank you for asking that. Did I interrupt you when you were giving an example or did you give an example? Yeah, no, I think okay. we're good. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, Okay, so I think that's all the questions for you, Brandy. Thank you so much for joining us and answering the questions. Uh, we really appreciate it. Yeah, it's such a great idea.
love it. Oh, thanks. Yeah, yeah. No, as you can see, I love reading, I love writing, and I love talking about it. But we've been here long enough, so I'll let you get on with your day. <laughs> thanks for having me, and I'll see you next time. Bye. Okay, so uh, I will answer the other questions that you have here. Is the session being recorded? Um, Ali, this is a live session on YouTube. So like all of our live sessions, if they're on YouTube, they will be in the lives, like they will be, they will stay recorded and they will live in our YouTube channel. You just have to go and look for self up live as one of the playlists and then you'll find all the videos that we've done live. Um, we cannot, unfortunately, share Brandy's email or phone number, but if you do want to uh, interact with Brandy or, like, um, like take classes, more classes, you can attend our free webinars. They're on our website. They're called webinars and workshops. And then we have um, – Brandy will give some of them. So depending on the section you want, so if it's, like, listening, um, speaking, writing, pick the section that you want on our website, and then you'll find – uh, the ones that Brandy is giving. But another thing is that if you are not in Canada and or if you're not in North America and you have, prefer, like if you prefer a time zone that works for you, so like if you prefer like IST or like uh, PHST, which is the Philippine Standard Time, or anything else, you will find um, uh, instructors who will provide you with lessons in that timeline, uh, in that time zone. So do check out our workshops and webinars. It's a great way to like interact with other students as well and like <clears throat> get more uh, support from instructors. Other than that, we of course have like uh, regist uh, certified instructors on our website that you can take classes from, but those are those are paid. Okay, uh, thank you everybody for joining us. Um, please leave suggestions on what you'd like to see more on Self Up Live. A lot of these episodes that we uh, have done are from suggestions that uh, viewers like you gave us. Um, you can also connect with us on our Instagram account, Selfhip Test Official. Um, we post most of our updates on there first. Um, so please do follow us uh, and stay up to date. I haven't uh, forgotten our trivia question. March 5 was National Poutine Day. What are the three key ingredients of poutine? And as suspected, a lot of you got this right. I'm going to scroll up. But the answer is fried potatoes, gravy, and cheese curds. Um, just something to know um, if you're, unfortunately, if you are somebody who is a vegetarian, the gravy contains like, uh, beef stock. So, um, I learned that the hard way, but you can, but there's like other options. Like it's definitely like a vegetarian option and there's like butter chicken, uh, poutine. And then there's like butter paneer poutine and then like any other poutine ver versions you like. And I feel like purists are going to be like, no, that's not authentic poutine, but we need we want to try things and we can't have beef stock so what do we do anyway uh, thank you so much for joining us please stay tuned for our next episode and we will share details uh on our instagram account but until then please uh stay safe and take care bye